Okay, today's session, um, or this week's session, uh, is interstitial condensation. So um, I, you've all taken part in the previous sessions where we talk about fabric heat loss, determining um, fabric heat loss. We spoke about uh, relative humidity, condensation, so on and so forth. So um, a lot of the terminology that I refer to uh, within this um, session uh, will, well, it will make sense because obviously we, you, you, when you're developing your understanding um, about the heat or the thermal environment. So what is it? So effectively, uh, it's when temperature and pressure differences force warm, humid air through hygroscopic materials until they reach a point cold enough to condense, which is dew point. Now, let me just explain that again. All right. So we talk about when the temperature and pressure differences. So the temperature difference. What do you think that? Or what do you think I mean by that? Hopefully you got that right. So the temperature difference. So when we talk about um, U value and dew point, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, we know that heat always travels to the coolest point. So if the temperature inside your house or inside the the, the structure, the building. Is warmer than outside we know that the heat is transferring outwards um, obviously in, in say winter the opposite is the case where it's it's uh, warm or oh, sorry the, the, the summer where it's warmer outside than in so we've got the heat gain coming in and then we've got the pressure differences uh, which is back to the the stack effect as you can see in the image there you remember we spoke about that pressure uh, being balanced about the, 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 the what we call the passive stack. Let me just write that down. Um, and there's no E on that. It's always like the... Do you remember the, the last session where we spoke about passive house? Which is about the, um, the incredibly uh, eco-friendly construction method uh, for building homes, etc, etc. That's effectively what... Uh, the passive house so it, it's now what we, we talk about is we is the passive ventilation and mostly the passive ventilation is what we're referring to as as um, natural ventilation so air just naturally being brought in through vacuum effect into the house through gaps and vents and so on and so forth and then it's cascaded through the building and cools the building out now the the, the hygroscopic materials um, are basically if we look at the words to remember okay words to remember we've got to get into the habit of using the correct terminology correct terminology especially when it comes to the exam and more than the exam uh, the, the project unit two project uh, because the lead examiner on his reports um, after the exam series when they look at the projects and the answer the, what what the students have done well what they haven't done well one of the things that they don't do well is use the correct industry terminology so we're talking about materials that absorb or allow vapor to pass through them so if we if we talk about a ball of cotton wool that's very hygroscopic it's, it, it's going to allow hygroscopic is to allow the vapor through hy, hydrothermal is like warm vapor so on and so forth right so hygro um, being the latin for water um, and then obviously you know what uh, scopic and thermal are so try and refer to them where possible okay so it, it effectively um, let's re recap so it's when the, the, the circumstances are such that the temperature and pressure differences forms force warm humid air through hygroscopic materials until they reach a point cold enough to condense so obviously when the the dry temperature the warm temperature has cooled rapidly and the vapor um, becomes um, so great that it, it, it creates 100% saturation 100% relative humidity and that's where it condensates it, the, the condense happens which is the dew point so here we can see some examples of interstitial condensation. Um, you can see there's a top left corner um, where joists and the ceiling. Um, we can see two examples of all the main one in the, 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 the thing about interstitial condensation is usually it's, it's over the entire wall surface. It's not just in the bottom corner where the skirting board meets or in the top left corner 
top right corner where that, that that's different circumstances when it comes to condensation and mold growth in buildings but what you see here is is um, typical examples of interstitial condensation so if you look at page 65 on your student on your student handbook um, or your student study book you will see um, pretty much the same examples of what I'm what, what I'm showing you here on the left hand side it basically shows a cross section of a wall uh, when the temperature and dew lines never meet so you can see you can see that here let me let me change the ink color um, let's change it to a green so we can see that that's where the, the temperature profile is so we've got the red temperature line going through its dropping temperature you can see um, as it goes through the insulation um, just here it drops dramatically downwards but you'll see that the dew point line the blue line at this point here doesn't meet so they're not going to have a condensation there we're not going to have a dew point so everything passes through the brick the exterior brick wall and passes out and that's not going to cause a problem but when we look at the the cross section on the right that's a situation where we've got it wrong and that you can see that the temperature and the dew point lines the red and the blue they actually do meet at this point here and now that's created um, a serious issue for condensation so looking a little bit more into uh, detail um, let's look at the factors of cause so what causes it so i mean there's there's a, just thousands and thousands of of, of um, uh, different ways and different measures that all contribute to interstitial condensation so as we look in here we can see steam and evaporation pressure difference inside and outside ventilation relative humidity so on and so forth so you see all of those uh, nine um, different areas what contributes and it could be multiple factors of each it could be just one so if we look at steam and evaporation which you know we could be looking at a laundry or a kitchen or a, a gym a lot of steam is produced um and then obviously rapid cooling evaporation where it's condensating on surfaces on a previous session i asked you to look at a gym um as a client I was asking you to prepare a, a brief explanation of the options available to him to manage relative humidity and evaporation um, we've just spoken about the pressure difference inside and outside of the of the structure we need to look at ventilation is there appropriate ventilation within the structure was it is it a retrofit building is it is it being renovated can we retrofit well what, what i mean by that is retrospectively fit so you know it wasn't built in when it was originally built but can we put it in now relative humidity we know about so if it's a high humidity factor then obviously we, we can start looking in that area the structure and composition of the elements so what type of stru structure is it what is the composition of the elements in other words what, an element can be a wall a floor a ceiling a roof it can be any part of the building which we refer to as an element and the composition is what is it made up of all right so that so we need to look at that what about um, surface finishes? So there's, there's, oh, and I'll cover surface finishes um, a little bit later on, but it's effectively how we finish so the plaster coating, the rendering, uh, the painted surfaces, is there vinyl surfaces, all sorts of stuff can contribute as well. What about the occupancy? So we all know we exhale um, vapour and moisture as, as human beings. So what about the occupancy, the number of people involved in the use of the building and just as importantly, the activity. So are they doing strenuous work? Is there a lot of people? Is there, you know, it, 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 there's so many different factors that we can look at. I mean, one of the common examples here, we can see end joist rot. And this is effectively where um, joists typically are, you, you have, effectively you have, um an external um an external brick skin like that and then we have an internal usually block or something this is just a typical construction so block struck construction there 
and let's put some insulation in the middle like that so what happens is um if we draw the same thing again here's the exterior of all the brickwork blah 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 and then what we've got here we've got uh, typically the joists okay are uh, put so this is the floor joist could be ceiling joist as well it could be roof joist it could be anything and then what what these are typically cut through the block okay so this bit of the joist actually sits inside the block meaning that the inside of the uh, the cavity the end the, the end of the joist here is exposed to any conditions like condensation internal um, condensation interstitial condensation so if it were to occur in the first example is that it, it, the timber is not ordinarily a, a a, a, a water va a, a, a vapor barrier so to speak it's it's imper it's it's impenetrable in the first instance so if it's if we put a joist if we put a piece of wood inside a sauna for a few hours you know we're not going to see much moisture going in but over time where it's just a, it's just constantly surrounded by moisture and we've got condensation actual water forming at the end of the joist it then it's then like the wick of a candle um, where it's got the capillary effect which it draws water in and obviously as it draws it in the end of the joist rots and then what we see is all of this starts to get infected uh, to the point where the actual joist itself um, actually fails in, in use and then we, we get that point there and that is going to just collapse like that okay so uh, th th these are signs here where you can see fun fungi uh, mold etc etc is a classic example of um, a common form of interstitial condensation it's not just interstitial condensation that uh, that causes uh, floor joists and so on so, forth, so on so forth to rot okay don't don't think that it's the only cause this is this is condensation this is poor ventilation this is this is a multiple of factors but this is one example of what you could identify as interstitial condensation so we mentioned earlier about paint, um, it, it, the paint on the walls, the glass or vinyl in the room, nothing like a kitchen or a bathroom. So, you, you know, you don't you, you paint your skirting boards and, you, and your architraves with glass and vinyl. Um, you don't really do the walls, um, especially in kitchens and bathrooms. You're going to get big problems there. Um, a, has a damp blocker been applied to control mold growth? mold growth so you can go into a, um, a a leading diy store i suppose and you can buy an off-the-shelf damp blocker typically people erroneously apply this to a bathroom ceiling because they've got spots of mold so what they do is they they wipe the mold off or try to and then they apply another coat of paint and they put some damp blocker on and they think yeah very nice 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 and then a few weeks, a month or two later, the mould is back because you haven't cured it. You haven't, you just haven't got the ventilation right. Um, you can inquire with a contractor who built the house to see what the um, the composition of the element is. Or so what's the composition of the wall? What's inside it? What's causing the problem? Or you can actually investigate inside a small area of the wall. So you can perhaps, um, depending on if you were doing renovation, It'd be easy enough to like rip the cupboards out of a kitchen or something because you can replace it with new kitchen anyway. So you might as well bang a few holes in the wall and have a look. Get your head in there, have a look, or get your phone in there, get some pictures and, and speak to people, speak to professionals, and, and, and or, or just investigate and research it. And then we got seasonal, uh, so position of the building, so with the orientation of the building, which direction does it face? Because we we always hear about south facing. Um, walls in terms of you know that gets most of the sun so it's great to have a garden that's south facing but if you've got an east facing wall directly facing east so in, in in the winter we we can often get warm atlantic winds which um, obviously hits cold exterior walls because it's winter here and then it causes a reverse of the interstitial condensation coming in so now we've got a problem of of the damp coming inwards rather than outwards because obviously the wall on the inside is going to be warm because we've got the heating on and then obviously on the outside we've got the warm meat in the cold brick so then that starts to get um, um that starts to draw in that vapor because of the condensation the dew point then that acts like a wick it's porous and then it starts to bring it in then the condensation gets wet and so on and so forth you're going to get you know, serious problems 
And just as a, an example, um, an external insulation such as hempcrete can be applied. So it's like a, an external render, like an external plaster, which has um, uh, vapor protective properties and so on. So it's just one solution that you could look at. Ventilation. So we spoke about this before. Um, about So are the vent bricks or chimney flues blocked? Are the vent bricks even there? Uh, this prevents passive stack ventilation, expelling humid air. So refer to the first slide where we looked at the passive ventilation by the, the cold air coming in, fresh air coming in at the bottom and expelling the warm, humid, stale air at the top. Um, and the vent bricks and the chimney flues, they, they, they have a role to play with that. And so have the windows with their trickle vents and the wee poles to get rid of condensation and to vent out air. Now, I want to speak to you a little bit about vapour barrier. OK, so this must be applied to construction of the wall. And it's typically, in fact, almost in every instance, it's on the warm side of the insulation to prevent moisture condensating at the cold surface. Now, this is also depends on where you are in the world. So in the UK, we would typically put the vapour barrier on the warm side of the insulation. So you may have a plaster coat on a plaster. But let's draw this. Let's 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 draw this. So we've got a plaster coat. Let's call it PC. Now, let's just write it. Plaster coat. Yeah. Um, let's just draw it like that and then we've got um, plasterboard nice green plasterboard there and then we, you can get green plasterboard it's actually called moisture board and it's usually for bathrooms especially where tiled area wet areas are going to be um, and then we're going to have we're going to have a nice bit of softwood um, there you can just about see that these these are hatchet these 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 symbols here like that cross for timber that's a usual symbol for uh, for timber and um, right so timber stud there and then we're going to have we're going to put our let's put it in black we're going to have our vapor barrier there one thing we haven't done is we haven't labelled this is plasterboard sorry about messing the screen up like this I don't care really to be honest if you were to really really push me for an answer I don't care um, and then we've got and we've got the um, insulation nice big thick insulation there sorry insulation and let's put that here because I can because I'm a rule breaker. Insulation is there. And then we've got an external brickwork. Um, let's do that in this colour. Because I like this colour. That's oh, nice purple brick there. There we go. There we go. Very nice. Very nice. And we can see there that the vapour barrier. Which I forgot to label. Um, let's do it all the way over here. Vapour barrier. Because I can. Vapour barrier all the way over there like that now what that's doing that's caught because this is the inside of the building and that's the outside obviously the back this would be that would equal the warm side so that would prevent vapor passing through to the insulation um, which would then um, it could possibly affect what well, it will well, it's not possibly it will affect it so if vapor was to get through there and then we start to um, start to affect the insulation that could uh, be detrimental to the insulation it could start to make it it could break it down it could all slump to the bottom then you've got cold bridging you've got no cavity you, you, your cavity is not filled at all then it, it just a multiple of issues going to uh, uh, are going to happen as a result of that so getting off the subject slightly or just shifting the, the subject slightly, we, we, we understand um, about the vapour resistance and its need and what it actually does and what causes the, uh, the symptoms to appear, so to speak. So I want to look at the vapour resistance. It's something that's measured in mu value. You heard that correct. Mu value. So it's like U value. U value is the, um, is the condensation dew point scenario with thermal 
um, thermal loss, thermal resistance, energy resistance within the, 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 the element. And the mu value is about vapor resistance. OK, now all of this leads to the image on the right. And, and not many of you will know what this image is all about. But effectively, the chap on the ground is, is Sir Isaac Newton. Um, one of the most um, important historical physicists uh, the world has seen and one of his theories is about gravity and gravity is equal to 9.81 meters per second squared so that's the speed of acceleration so if you've got a, a, an object such as an apple which is the mass it will travel at 9.81 meters per second squared in fact it, it, when you say the second squared what that actually means is um, it's not it, a, an object will travel at 9.81 meters per second but then when you talk about the speed of the object so instead of the apple just dropping from the tree onto his head which is when he had his eureka moment when he had his, his light bulb moment if you was holding that apple at the same height and you threw it on him obviously that's going to hurt a lot more so that would be 9.81 meters per second per second you get me so it, it so initially it's 9.81 meters per second in terms of gravity acceleration but then that acceleration is timed over an, a second so it's second squared and this just happens to be the weight we refer to in phys in physics as a newton <clears throat> okay so this is where we're going with um all this nonsense about gravity and newtons and so on and so forth because I want to, it's just a bit of fun this is really, but it's just to open your eyes up about the connecting physics um, to this area of vapour and so on and so forth. And how things fit in with the universe in general, so to speak. But And, and this will help you in the next um, section for this unit, which we start look, looking at basic structural mechanics and so on and so forth. So this, you'll already be well versed on Newton. So uh, we know that Newton... Um, is approximately 98 grams which is i mean if we look at this obviously we know this it's 9.81 meters meters sorry per second squared and then an apple equals 98.1 grams and that's approximate so you can see there's a relationship there and it and it you know you could say that you know that's a hundred grams and that um and this is roughly 10 seconds so on and so forth okay so this is where we're going let's get rid of this let's get rid of this right so what i want to talk about is the vapor resistance of materials and the units that they're measured in is quite surprising um it's generally measured uh, in something called uh, mu value. OK, now mu value. <laughs> yeah, trust me, um, is written like this. So it's like a mu value. And it is pronounced mu value and it is uh, the units that we measure. So U value is about the um, thermal resistance, the resistivity of heat transfer, so on and so forth. But the mu value is the resistance of moisture uh, going through. Now, it's quite strange the way it's written. So the SI unit, are you all familiar with the SI bit about units? It's actually uh, derived from French as in système international. So it's the international system, SI. OK, so it's a, an international standard, so to speak. So an SI unit is the unit that these things are measured in. Now, when we measure the, re the vapour resistance of materials, some of the examples, I'll come, I'll come back to that um, SI unit shortly. Let me just, uh, because it's written, uh, let, let, OK, I'll just, I'll give you the SI unit to start with. Um, so SI equals, um, so we've got uh, giganewtons per second per kilogram, or we can have meganewtons per second 
per gram and they both equal a move value. Now you're probably thinking, what is he going on about? And why is he, what, what, what's he doing this for? Well, I'll, I'll show you. And this is the fun bit. This is, trust me, bear, bear with me. So the, the, what we call that, and this U value, when we look at materials, it's also known as um, what they refer to materials as perms. Perms. And that's short for uh, permeability. So if something's permeable, then it will absorb. OK, it will absorb moisture, so on and so forth. So they give a value of a perm. Now, let, let's give you some examples of, of materials. Um, so uh, we're talking uh, wool insulation. Wool insulation is one. Um, we can say that, and, the, and I'm not just making these up. These are the values. Trust me, these are the valuable, uh, valuables. Um, OSB board, which is effectively chipboard, chipboard sheet material, so on and so forth, has got a value of 50. Okay. And then we say, uh, we can say concrete has a value of 100 to 130. And then we can go up to polythene, so thick black plastic has a value of, wait for it, 100,000. So if you imagine that you're passing vapour or moisture through any of these materials, clearly wool insulation doesn't fare very well. Um, whereas polythene, obviously, are 100,000 perms. So it's, it's very, very water resistant, vapour resistant. And generally, we, we, we use scales of 1 to 10, OK, generally. But anything over 10, uh, we go down the road of um, very, very permeable. Uh, and So permeable is 1. Obviously, polythene is not very permeable. OK, so let's get rid of that. And now let's look at where I'm going with all of this. Um, what I want you to do first is just look at the weight of a Newton, right? Now, what does a Newton weigh? Okay, well, we know it's 9.81 grams, uh, sorry, 98.1 grams, but let's have a closer look. So things that, things that weigh approximately one Newton are as follows. So the classic is the apple, which is the, uh, the piece of fruit that fell on Newton's head. Um, but if you don't like apples, an orange will do. So that's about the same thing. The average size of a chocolate bar, a small chocolate bar, or five chicken nuggets, depending on what your uh, what your appetite is, and one of those things, a quarter pounder. And yes, the last two being incredibly unhealthy and yucky, and as a vegetarian, well, I think the first two will suit me. Um, and Newton also weighs two scrambled eggs, which is yum yum, very nice. And last of all, the average weight or the weight of approximately 102 10 pound notes. I think I've got your attention now. So now we know what uh, typically a Newton weighs. This is how we can use that information. So we look at um, a typical piece of uh, a, a, a typical piece, a, a typical material. Let's say um, it has a perm value or a, a move value of 20 giganewtons per kilogram. That is the equivalent to 20, wait for it, 1000000000 billion newtons or apples or <laughs> 100 billion chicken nuggets and the force of that is needed to push one kilogram of vapor through that material 
Okay, so if you think about it, something that has a value of 20 giganewtons, you will need 20 billion apples or 100 billion chicken nuggets to force one kilogram of vapor through that material in one second. And here's the other one. Alternatively, you'll like this. Here we go. Alternatively, you can do it the other way. And that way is as follows. Um, if you look at the, if you wanted to do it with, let's say five chicken nuggets, or one apple, one Newton, it will take two O E nine. That's a nine. Let me let me just let me scrub down a little bit there. Twenty E. Let's get my pen back. Nine seconds. Let's convert that 20 E9 seconds equals 634 years and a month or so. There we go. That's put it into perspective. So the more resistant, vapor resistant a material is, the more chicken nuggets or quarter pounders or newtons or apples will be needed to force one kilogram of vapor through material in one second or one apple pushing one kilogram of vapor through the material but it will take 634 years and a month or so okay so that ends the session, so hopefully we understand a bit more about interstitial condensation, how it's formed, very closely linked to um, dew point condensation, so on and so forth. And you get the idea, it's about pressure, it's about temperature inside and outside, it's about the balance of the, of the passive stack ventilation within the structure um, and around the structure. It's about temperature, it's about relative humidity, it's about the, 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 the structural element being um, having a, a correct composition of materials in place, a vapour barrier that has a resistance to all those apples. Okay, so that ends that session. Um, the next thing we're going to look at in the next session will be the principles of sound and acoustics and Sabine formula. Until then, you know what I'm going to say. Answer the question and give the question back. <laughs>